very elementary graph theory, and which we all are acquainted with now. <coughs> Basically, the idea is driven by the following. This is what you want to prove. You take, uh, so this is what we want to do. So this could be something like a, what are convex sets in R2, something like a disk, okay? A unit disk, for example, is a convex set. Or a triangle. You have a continuous function. The assertion is this function has a fixed point. It has a fixed point. This is what is called Brouwer's uh, fixed point theorem. What is meant by fixed point uh, of a function? Yeah. Huh? All right. So I need some extra assumptions. <laughs> yeah, you need non-empty at least, so compact convex. In fact, let's take it to be a triangular disk. Homeo up to homeomorphism, a triangular disk and a, a circular disk, a unit disk, are actually homeomorphic. They are actually homeomorphic to each other. Strange, but it's true, okay? They are homeomorphic to each other. Whether you take this or this, they are homeomorphic. <coughs> Therefore, showing that this has a fixed point is equivalent to showing that that has a fixed point. Because you can define Actually, you can define homeomorphism from this to that, okay? Strangely, the proof of this depends on an idea. And this is called a triangulation. So what is it that I want to do now? Labeled vertices. Respectively. We want to subdivide, we want to divide this triangle into smaller triangles. Divide such that. What I would like to have is something like this. This is fine. So I can really, there is no 
restriction on how many triangles you want to have. Should also tell you what is not allowed. No vertex of uh, a smaller baby triangle is on open line, line segment of some other triangle. What I will not allow, for example, is uh, what kind of thing. This is not okay. Uh, unless, uh, of course, you treat these as different triangles. You can, you can treat them as different triangles. What you can do is you can still subdivide this. This is fine. But then I'll treat these as two different triangles. This is fine. Okay? What should not happen? This is not okay. <coughs> this has been labeled 1, that is labeled 2, that is labeled 3. Now you want to put labels on the vertices of these smaller triangles. Such a thing, this is called triangulation. A triangulation. So triangulation is a fairly general idea. You put labels on these vertices. Have I of course, by doing this, this vertex happens to be internal. So therefore, this is not okay. This is certainly not okay. I is this clear? This vertex, which is vertex of that triangle as well as that triangle, happens to be internal to this bottom triangle, to this triangle here. That is not okay. Therefore, this is not a triangulation. Okay? <laughs> yeah, so already you have an example of what is not. If I don't have that line, then it is not a triangulation, okay? But just with this restriction, you can form triangulation in any manner you want. There are obviously far too many ways in which you can triangulate a given triangle. I want to give labels 1, 2, 3 to the vertices of these baby triangles, retaining the earlier labels, of course. So I'm not going to wipe off these labels. These labels are 1, 2, 3 as they are. The rule is that there are some vertices here, obviously, that lie on the sides of this bigger triangle such as this vertex, this vertex, those three vertices, those two vertices. The remaining vertices are inside that triangle. Those vertices that are on the side of uh, <coughs> that original triangle have to be given label of uh, either one of the endpoints. Therefore, this has to be labeled either one or two. You just choose any one. Let's say you choose one. This has to be labeled either one or two. I can still choose one. That's okay. This has to be labeled either two or three. I can call it three. This has to be labeled either one or three. So I can. The internal vertices can be labeled in any way you want to. Not uh, choosing one of the three labels, one, two, or three. Not four, of course. Okay. Have I labeled everything? No. 
this is not yet labeled. Label the vertices of smaller triangles using labels one, two, three as follows. One, if a vertex is on the side with end vertices i and j, then the vertex must get labeled. I R J. It cannot get third label, that is all that I am saying. This could not have been labeled three, that is not okay. Other than that, you are free. I could have labeled both of them to be two, that is perfectly all right. If a vertex is inside any <coughs> now you look at the labels that the smaller triangles get they could be of various kinds. Just look at the three end points of, for example, this gets label 1, 1, 1. That also gets label, this gets label 1, 1, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at the labels of smaller triangles, full if the three vertices have three distinct labels. So this is of course not full. That is that is not full. In fact, many of them will not be full. This is not full. This is not full. This is not full. Is there anything that is full here? Yes. Yes. There is a one, two, three here. So this is full. This is also full. Anything else? This is also full. Is that all? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the Sparna's theorem that we want to prove says that there will always be full triangles. There will always be full triangles no matter how you label the vertices following these stipulations. This is a purely combinatorial assertion and uh, <laughs> I 
as with many other things, this has several proofs. We'll just, just have one of them here. There are many. There are at least two or three other proofs to this. They all depend on the following thing. When you want to prove that there is at least one, one of them, can I prove that there is an odd number of full triangles? Will that prove that there is at least one? Yes. I mean, that is actually a stronger statement. We actually prove. the number of odd triangles, the number of full triangles. Yeah, this is in fact stronger. You are even telling that there will not be two full triangles. If there are, if you spot two, then there must be at least three. <laughs> Let's just uh, fix up the labels one and two. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to look at it as if uh, each triangle is a vertex. Each triangle is a vertex in my graph. Each small triangle is a vertex. So therefore, there is a large number of vertices here. The infinite uh, boundaries that you have, this is, a, this is another vertex. So this is one vertex. This is another vertex. And this is... those walls, they will, therefore, this really has very large number of vertices. The graph that I have actually is a graph that has very large number of vertices. For, we construct a graph, graph G with vertex set V that consists of uh, all small triangles and the three <coughs> unbounded on each side. <coughs> I just have to tell you the rule how to draw this graph. Join two vertices, draw an edge, between two vertices if they share side or a wall with labels one and two. For example, this is one, this is one here. Yeah, there will be an edge between this vertex and this, like this, okay? Now, 
there will also be an edge between this vertex and this vertex. Or for that matter, there will also be an edge between these, etc., etc. Look at any small triangle first. Look at any small triangle. What are the possibilities for its uh, boundaries? The three boundaries that a small triangle has. Maybe there is no side that has uh, <laughs> label 1, 2 at all. In that case, its degree is clearly 0. Its degree is 0. If there is no 1, 2, then you don't need to bother about it at all. Then its degree is 0. If there is a 1, 2, Suppose I have another 2, then the degree of this vertex would be 2. Is that clear? The degree of this vertex will be exactly equal to 2, one going that way and one going that way. If it is all of 1, 2 and 3, then the degree will be exactly equal to 1. Okay? Is this point clear? Or? Yeah. Where is the problem? Yeah, in fact, this is the most subtle point here. I'm willing to explain this uh, again. Uh, is it clear that this will have degree 2? Because this is the wall. And this is another wall. There will be adjoining region here. So the degree of this vertex is 2. For this vertex, the degree is only equal to 1. Because that is the wall. So if you have a full triangle, the degree will be equal to 1. The degree will actually be equal to 1. What are the other possibilities? Well, it could be one is repeated. That's fine. No problems. This will have, the degree still will be equal to 2. Okay. Sorry? This will have degree 2. Is that clear or it's not clear? Huh? Yeah. There will be large number of triangles whose degree is 0 actually. There will be many whose degree is equal to 0. The claim I want to make is any small triangle, any small triangle has, is full if and only if its degree is equal to 1. Okay? <laughs> In fact, for that matter, what are the possible degrees? There is no triangle whose degree, small triangle, whose degree will be equal to 3. That is just not possible. Just cannot have a small triangle with degree 3. Because, just think of this, you just cannot get into this possibility. How can you have all the three sides, 1 and 2 only? I mean, that's sort of the worst that one can do. Is that clear? So the degree can be at most 2, it cannot be equal to 3. So let's consider any small triangle. Its degree is either 0, 1, or 2. It will never be equal to 3. Yeah, quite easy to argue because to have degree 3, one vertex will have to be labeled 1. To make degree this way, you'll have to either label label this two, but then you cannot really get this side. Both the labels are repeated two two. You cannot have all the three sides with <laughs> labels one and two. That's just not possible. So degree three is ruled out. Further, we get a small triangle with degree 1. Or odd degree. Because there is no 3. If and only if that triangle is full.
Therefore, to prove this assertion, it is enough to show that the number of vertices of odd degree in this graph, the internal vertices, <laughs> is an odd number. Now let's look at the sides. Consider the sides of uh, Clearly, see over here the degree, these levels are only 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, whatever. Therefore, the degree of this is 0. That's clear. Degree of this is also 0. It only remains to see what is the degree of this. A positive degree. is obtained only on the region adjoining AB. In the situation we are looking at, the degree actually is equal to 1. Degree is equal to 1, 1, 2. I want to say that the degree of this region will be an odd number. It is simply like this. This is a lemma that one can prove independently. If you have a set of things from on a line, suppose this is red and this is blue. Okay, and in between your, you put red, blue, red, blue in any manner you want to. How many times do I get red, blue pairs? Once here, once here, once here, three times. It will happen an odd number of times for sure. It will definitely happen an odd number of times. It cannot happen an even number of times because you begin with red and end with blue. Because you begin with red and end with blue, the number of red-blue changes has to be an odd number. It has to be an odd number because you begin with something and end with something else. If you begin with red and also end with red, it, I would argue <laughs> with the same idea that it would be an even number. In this case, it has to be an odd number. So let's sort of independently write this as a lemma or assertion. in any manner with A getting label 1 and B getting label 2. Then the number of 1, 2 segments Okay, it's really a very simple parity matter. Where do I get segment one to? Here. Any anywhere else? one. 
How do I prove it? There could be many ways of proving this. <laughs> because starting from one, you hit one somewhere, therefore this may even be squeezed out. Okay? You can actually squeeze this out and it's as if instead of beginning there, you're beginning there. You may as well begin there. So any time you have consecutive ones or consecutive twos, they can be brought together. And then I'll really have a situation where it is one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> is it clear? Now count how many times you, this has to be an odd number, that's clear. It has to be an odd number because you begin with one and end with two and end with a two, okay? <laughs> Therefore, it has to be an odd number. Else, if you're not uh, con convinced about this, run an induction. You can make an induction on n. It's quite possible to <laughs> run an induction on n, the number of internal points on that segment. If there is no, if n is equal to zero, then clearly there is one change, one, two the whole line. <laughs> Therefore, this assertion says that the degree of this vertex, which I have called x here, this has degree an odd number. In this case, it's equal to 1. This is degree zero. This has degree zero. Uh, basic fact that comes to us from graph theory says that number of odd vertices in any graph is an even number. Number of vertices of odd degrees even. There is one odd vertex here. There is one odd vertex here. Therefore, there must be the number of odd vertices inside, number of baby triangles that are full is an odd number. The assertion shows that the region with boundary 1, 2, with boundary AB has an odd degree therefore finally since the number of vertices of uh, odd degree is even we have an odd number of full, that's exactly what we wanted to prove. Whereas uh, the theorem we stated just said that you have at least one. What we actually ended up proving is you have a, an odd number of full triangles. So we proved something clearly stronger. Okay, just an idea about how Brouwer's fixed point theorem is proved using this. That's not really very difficult. Because the major idea comes from Conveniently, in fact, take an equilateral triangle. <coughs> what one can do if you call this uh, vector notation, if this is x bar, this is y bar, and this is z bar, then any point which is on the line yz has a representation of the form. Let's see what that amounts to. Lambda y plus mu z. Okay. 
This gives you all the points on this line. If I want to restrict myself to the line segment BC, just the finite line segment BC, then I should write lambda y plus mu z with the provision that lambda plus mu is equal to 1 and both lambda and mu are between 0 and 1. So this is what is called convex combination. So convex combination is the line, is finite, it's the line segment BC. So that's, that's on a single dimension. If you want to, if you take convex combination of A, B and C, then it would look like, I'll write, it is lambda 1 x plus lambda 2y plus lambda 3z zero less than or equal to lambda i less than or equal to one lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three is equal to one that triangle anything in that triangle this is uh, yeah what topologists call the barycentric division okay so any point here is described uniquely the lambda one lambda two lambda three are determined uniquely in fact a point on the line bc will have the property that lambda 1 is equal to 0. You don't need x to describe that, okay? <coughs> so this is, just as you have linear combination, this is a convex combination. That closed triangle is a convex hull. It's a convex hull of those three points A, B, C that are not collinear, that are not collinear, they're convex hull is that closed triangle. Then divide that triangle into smaller triangles like this, etc., etc. Before, before we do that, what is it that we are given here? F is a function on that triangle ABC. So let's call that triangle, so let's denote this by S. F is a function from S to S. F is continuous. Thanks to all this, what I can do is, I can now forget about this x, y, z. I can just say that I am looking at f of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. It's as good as saying that. This will be some, so you can say that this will have three coordinates again. So this will be f1, f2, f3. These are coordinate functions. These are continuous. What is f1, f2, f3? What will happen here is I can write this in the form mu 1x plus mu 2y plus mu 3z, which is also a convex combination because that function s, function f is from s to itself. Therefore, you are mapping that triangle to itself. Okay, with the same provision mu1 plus mu2 plus mu3 is equal to 1. Okay, so mu1 is what I call f1, mu2 is what I call f2, mu3 is, this is a continuous function. If f is a continuous function, these are, these coordinate functions are continuous functions. Then I do this labeling with the baby triangles being labeled, which way should they be labeled? It may be the case that there are two eyes that satisfy this property. No problems, just choose one, any one of those eyes. No problems at all, <laughs> okay? 
So if there is a choice involved here, you can, you can make your, one of, for one of the eyes, this has to be true. It cannot be true that for every eye, just see what will happen if f i of w is less than w i for every i. I should be writing the coordinates here. Okay, these are coordinates. So w1 plus w2 plus w3 is equal to 1. Okay, that is the idea. Say that again. Given a point W, label, label, yeah, thank you. Label W by I, if this cannot be true, this cannot happen for every I because the sum of all the W1 plus W2 plus W3 is equal to 1. And sum of this, these are also F1 plus F2 plus F3 is also equal to 1, convex combination. So these coordinates must add to 1. And then if this is, this is the case, then I get a contradiction 1 is strictly less than 1. Therefore, for some i, this has to hold. Maybe it holds for two i's. That's OK. Doesn't matter. Just look at this original triangle that got the label 1, 2 here. Then if W1 is positive, W2 is also positive. These will, I leave it <laughs> to you to check this. The points on the line AB will get labels that come only from 1 or 2. The points on the line BC will get labels that come only from the same. <laughs> and what we are looking for, just see what we are looking for is, we are looking for f i of w is equal to w i for every i. That's exactly a fixed point. That's exactly what we mean by fixed point, okay? So this will divide that triangle into various parts. Make a triangulation of that triangle. Make a sufficiently fine triangulation of that triangle. You can stipulate your, how large these triangles could be, the lengths. You can even divide this into equilateral triangles. Congruent equilateral triangles, sufficiently many in number. So that each one is really very small. Using Sperner's theorem, I will know that inside there is a full triangle. That full triangle, I'll see a subdivide further. I'll keep doing this infinitely many times. I'll repeat this infinitely many times. Eventually, the small triangle gets divided into still smaller triangles and still smaller triangles, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, I'll get a point which is common to all of them. What is this called? Compact set. Therefore. Intersection property. The five, there will be a, a unique point common to all these triangles. Inside the inside the bigger triangle will be small triangle that is full. The inside the small full triangle will be still smaller full triangles. So there'll be a sequence of uh, full triangles that I'll get. Finally, limiting into a point, and then my claim would be that that point is a fixed point. That point is a fixed point that I'm looking for. It will satisfy all these three properties. It will satisfy if i of w is less than or equal to, is greater than or equal to w i for every i. And if that is true, if this is true for every i, then it means that this must be equal. If i of w must be equal to w i, because you have inequalities. If this is true for every i, then it means that this must be equal to this. Okay, because the sum of these i equal to 1, 2, 3 is equal to 1. The sum of these i is equal to 1, 2, 3 is also equal to 1. So if this holds for every i, then you must have equality here. And that is a fixed point. That's exactly a fixed point. So the remaining part, namely showing that there is a point of convergence <laughs> and 
that point of convergence will actually work out to be the fixed point, a fixed point that you're looking for. I'll leave it to you. This is a nice uh, exercise, but it's routine analysis. It's fairly routine analysis that uh, to work out. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, really a very nice application of elementary graph uh, theory. Uh, there are versions of uh, Spermus theorem that hold for higher dimensions. So think about this. So uh, what I'm saying is, is, instead of starting with a triangle, start with a tetrahedron. Start with a tetrahedron in three dimensions. Take a regular tetrahedron because it does not really matter because you're looking at homeomorphic objects. So take a regular tetrahedron give the labels one, two, three, four to the four vertices. Divide that uh, tetrahedron into smaller tetrahedra, essentially with the same kind of stipulation. Just think what stipulation you'll require. So that's sort of a, <coughs> instead of triangulation, you are really dividing it into tetrahedra, okay? Those that are on the boundary, that means now, a face, face of that regular tetrahedron. Suppose the face is one, two, three, then they must get label either one, two, or three. We cannot get label four. Only with that stipulation, there is a small tetrahedron with full labels, one, two, three, four, okay? So that is version of Spurner's theorem, which will use this version, I mean, which will use the two-dimensional version. And uh, therefore, a version of uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem also, Brouwer's fixed point theorem is true not just in R2, it's true in any, any Rn, n-dimensional space. Take a convex, uh, compact, non-empty object. <laughs> R1, that there is a fixed point. Combinatorial proof, essentially it's the same, same way, yeah. You need a limiting process here, okay? That part is analysis. That part, of course, is analysis. It's not that we can bypass analysis completely, so we should not be under <laughs> this wrong impression that the graph theory can completely bypass that analysis is untrue. That is just untrue. You have to, you require that requisite knowledge of Cauchy sequences, uh, convergent sequences, etc., etc., okay? That you certainly require. <laughs> is that clear? It's just that it makes things easy. Uh, Combinatorics large number of times does solve the problems. If it doesn't solve the problems, it makes the understanding easier. So that is the main advantage of looking at things combinatorially. Understanding becomes much, much better. <coughs> and uh, so that is the n-dimensional version. Uh, uh, n-dimensional tetrahedron is what is called a simplex. That's called a simplex. Simplex in n dimensions. Simplex in n dimension is the smallest uh, polytope. It's a polytope with the least number of uh, vertices. If you have n dimensional simplex, then you require at least n plus one vertices. In two dimensions, you require at least three vertices, and that forms a triangle. Okay. So simplex in two dimensions is what we call triangle. Okay. So in n dimensions, it is n plus uh, n plus one vertices and a convex hull of uh, n plus one points in Rn in general position. Now, what is my general position here has to be understood properly. What does that mean? No three points are collinear. No four points are in one plane. So that you, should, you, should, you should avoid the degenerate situation. Should not get into degenerate situation. Four points should not determine the same plane. Three points will because no three are on the same line. So if you give me any three points, they will give me a plane. But if you give me a fourth point, it should not lie in the same plane that those three points determine. So that, that will determine a three-dimensional space, etc., etc. So this n plus one point should be in general position. That is what we are saying. So they should not lie inside a hyperplane. <coughs> okay, so far so good. Now, couple of uh, quick ideas. OK. 
okay, you begin with a simple graph. with vertices by g minus vi. What I mean is you delete that vertex. You throw out that vertex vi. Induce graph. Induce subgraph. with vertex set so here are a couple of uh, combinatorial assertions should be fairly easy to prove Okay, just see what this is counting. Take an edge of the form, let's say VR, VS. This is an edge. This edge will get counted in the numerator. How many times will this get counted in the numerator? N minus two times, because it will not get counted when I is equal to R and will not get counted when i is equal to s. Remaining times it will get counted. Therefore, this edge will get counted in the numerator n minus 2 times. But you have n minus 2 in the denominator and that's exactly what this is saying. Therefore, that is two-way counting. This in fact is even quite clear because this part is the total number of edges. And this is saying you look at all those edges in which Vj does not occur. Now the edges are only of two types, those in which Vj occurs and those in which Vj does not occur. Those in which Vj occurs are here. Those in which Vj does not occur are obtained by looking at all the edges from those, uh, look at those uh, which you remove those that have uh, VJ. Why am I doing this? Uh, yes, the reason we are doing this is suppose we have uh, these graphs are graphs in their own right. They are simple graphs. Suppose someone has given a list for me that has this, uh, that list hmm. 
So I'm not told what G is. If G is known, then I can of course find what this list is. That's clear. Because just remove that vertex, remove all the edges that are at that vertex. You, so if I want to look at H1, remove the vertex V1, remove all the edges at V1, you get H1, etc. Suppose on the other hand, this list is given to me. Can I construct the graph G from this list? This looks intuitively very, very, very <laughs> true, but something that has not been proved. Okay? Something that has not been, this is a deceptively simple statement. Unfortunately, for very special classes of graphs, people have been able to provide proof for this. So this is what is called, so we'll take a break by, I'll state this conjecture and then we'll break. Ulam reconstruction conjecture. Let of vertex deleted G can be uniquely reconstructed The point is I'm not even told that this is H1, this is H2, etc. If I know that this is H1, then it would not be. It's just that a set of uh, N vertices, so it's as good as saying that N papers are given to me on which N graphs, each with N minus 1 vertices are drawn. Labels have not been put on those. You have to, it's a question of pasting operation. You have to patch them up, You're like a jigsaw puzzle. You have to patch this up in such a way that this, this will result into the, this list will be the exactly the vertex deleted subgraphs that you started with. This looks intuitively very, very obvious. It will be very difficult to find a counter example for something like this, nor has anybody been able to. At the same time, that doesn't mean that some, someone has been able to prove this conjecture as such. So it still stands as it is. So we'll break. Uh, for a few minutes. <laughs>